So she grew up in a in the Catholic Church. She didn't have all those answers given to her right away. They had to dig into it and sort out who had the answers. And Christians ought to have answers. We're supposed to be ready to give a defense for our hope that's within us, with gentleness and you know reverence. But we. These are Jews. I, thought, I just turned my page. Okay. They received the word with great eagerness. That's another great trait, right? Eagerness. Uh, to be eager to want to study the scriptures. Now, you know, I grew up not in the church also. And we didn't study our Bibles at home. And when I was being taught the truth by my brother, I had a lot of questions and I started reading the scriptures a lot and digging a lot. And I was like, what's, what's all this about? And I was eager and I, was, I wanted to read. And whenever I get home from uh, whatever work, I, I get into the scriptures. But as time goes on, I haven't always been that eager. How about you? So anyway, it's just, just a question for you to think to yourself and, and not confess anything or say, yeah, I lost my eagerness. Uh, I'm not eager to study the scriptures anymore, but you know, we I think we we go and you know like this. We have things that spark us. Maybe a lesson sparks us, or a situation sparks our interest or our understanding. That I better study on that. We don't have to know everything, right? And if you think you have to know everything, you'll never teach anybody anything. So remember. One of our first lessons about Paul was, of course, he was very steeped in Old Testament scriptures. I understand that. But as soon as he knew about Jesus, he was preaching Jesus. I mean, right away. I'm going to preach Jesus. And all of us here can preach Jesus to some degree. What it amounts to is whether we have the courage and the boldness like Paul had. Right. <clears throat> That's a good point. Right. So they're eager to learn, not eager to learn so that they can defend or fight. I think that's true. Yes. Sometimes just getting started is the hard part. Once you study, things open up. Like, oh wow, if we're open to it. And I think these guys, these people were open to the Word. They were eager. They were willing to listen, willing to change. That's a heart situation. And that's the kind of heart that we need to have likewise. <clears throat> so, a number of those people believe, then it's not any wonder, is it? If you have an open heart to the Scriptures, then it's a lot easier to obey the Gospel. It's a lot easier to learn and move forward. 
We're not all at the same place in openness towards the Scriptures, but it was, it's refreshing to find this amidst all the Jews that were always attacking him, that finally we find some Jews that care about the Scriptures more than their traditions, or more than what they want to believe, or what they like. For those who come out of uh, denominationalism or, or non-churched, there's a lot of traditions they've got to get past uh, to accept the gospel. And you struggle with it. <clears throat> and so, that's just part of life. Okay, so, many of them believe, verse 12, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men, so Jews and Greeks are obeying the gospel because these people have the right heart, the right soil. We talk about the parable of the soils or whatever. They had the right soil. But when the Jews of Thessalonica found out, they got on their bicycle and there they went again. Or their whatever it is, their tripods, or I mean it's tripod. <laughs> Skateboard, their their horse, whatever it is. I mean they're just like they are focused to get Paul. So there they go again. And I, you know, we talked about this last time and a couple times, but really, who's behind this persecution? Satan is behind it. This is all satanic work to try to take Paul out of the equation. Try to knock him out. They tried to stone him to death. That didn't work. Talked about that before. Okay, so they escort him, they get him down to Athens, and that's what we want to talk about um, now. That was the last slide from last class. Uh, so Paul is transforming lives boldly, and he's telling them about the glory of Christ. And now he's heading to a new horizon. Paul is now in Athens. And this is, I've entitled, Getting to Know the Unknown God. So let's read a little bit. Chapter 17, verse 16. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogues with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears so we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. Well, Athens is a city full of idols. I have never been there personally, but I see pictures and I've studied a little bit about this. Here's a couple of things that uh, were said about the Athenian people or people in Athens. Petronius some guy way back when, said, it is easier to find a God than a man there. Lucian wrote, on every side there were altars, victims, temples, and festivals. So everywhere. It's not just altars and temples. There were things being killed and sacrificed all through the city. What do we have on our corners here in Lubbock? <laughs> They're usually not on the corner. Well, there are some are in the corner, some are not in the corner. That's a deep question. Okay. Banks, service stations, drugstores. You know, those are kind of the big things on the, around Lubbock. We see lots of gas stations and banks. Banks, <laughs> gas stations, we just keep adding on. What else is, you know, water burger? But, but those are not idols. But for them, it would have been on every corner, there's a temple, or there's a bust of something, or some kind of idol, or a, an altar, all through town. You could stand in one place in the city by what I've looked at some maps, and there are altars 
and temples within your viewing point. Several of them. Paul is waiting for Silas. He's actually in Athens alone, it looks like. <clears throat> he didn't have any helpers at this point. So this whole, whole thing in, in chapter 17, when he's in Athens, his sermon and all that, he's just by himself, as far as we can tell. What a bold, courageous man <laughs> talking to people that are idolaters and into satanic things and anything other than the true God. Yes. That's right. That's my next point. Man, thank you. See, look at my notes. It, that's a good point. So Paul was provoked. And what that word provoked within him, that's an interesting thing, is that's the same word that was used about Paul and Barnabas getting into a spat. It's a sharp, we talk about it being a sharp disagreement. As I study the Scripture, And all these temples and all this heathenism and a lot of the, the stuff that you see, some of those statues and stuff, they are obscene. Have you ever seen any Greek art? And he's everywhere he goes, he's observing. Right? He was observing the city full of idols. And we see that uh, in chapter 17, verse uh, 22. Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects, for while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, so there again it shows he wasn't just standing at the edge of the town. He's going through and he's looking, he's just absorbing all this culture, all this evil that really Satan is behind. He sees all these things and he's like, Oh man. And he didn't, he didn't just take it like a tourist, like, he, like uh, Zach is saying. It stirred his heart to severe anger. And, the, and I, as I thought about that, it's like, and I think that's what you're getting at. As we look around even in this town, which has got many churches rather than idols, but a lot of the churches are... I'm not here to talk about churches, but I'm here to talk about there's other things that go on in this city too. There's a lot of things in our culture that we get used to, don't we? Don't we get used to it? And maybe it doesn't burn in us like it used to. When we look around and we observe what people are doing or worshiping, whether it's money, whether it's power, Whatever it is, a lot of people worship things that are still idols. They may not have a statue of it. But this was just so blatant that he just... He was really angry about it. His emotion was stirred deeply. And instead of just walking around saying, You're going to hell! Look what the Scripture says. So verse 16... His spirit was provoked. In verse 17, there's a little word called so. It's a conjunction. It's like, because of what I just saw, he went to the synagogue. And instead of being angry, he preaches and teaches or reasons, discusses things about God with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles first. Where else did he go? <laughs> he went to the marketplace. How often? Daily. I don't know how long he was at, in Athens, but for some period of time, and he wasn't content to just reason with those who were more like him in mindset. He was going around the marketplace every day talking to anybody he could talk to 
that would, is willing to listen. Makes me think of street preachers or, you know, people with lots of guts to go downtown Seattle or something. <laughs> and that's a crazy place if you've ever been there. Oh, you, you know what I'm talking about. It's a secret. There's a lot of craziness in Seattle. And I didn't even live there. But anyway, it's interesting how his, his emotion was so strong, he couldn't stop talking about things. It, we don't get the impression that he was mean-spirited or angry, but he was burning inside. He said, these people need to know Jesus. Somebody's got to say something. And it's kind of stepping on my toes. Because how many people around here need to know Jesus? And what am I willing to do? I know we can't all go downtown, go to the mall, or go to around Texas Tech and just hang out and try to teach people. We have jobs to do and stuff like that. But it's an attitude that we need to have, and I need to have, that's more, more evangelistic. Right? It's easy to get content and used to things. One thing that I thought about when, uh, when I was thinking about the city of idols and what he saw and how it affected him, how it was shocking, even as a, a new preacher just starting my first work in, in Washington State, that's why I know about Seattle, the congregation we went to was an old congregation and an old building, I mean, this is no joke. The carpet was carpet pad. Industrial carpet pad that they had had for years and years and years with duct tape on a lot of scenes. And I could go on and on about the things I saw when I first got, I'm thinking, what? I know we're not supposed to be about, you know, money and being extravagant. But let's be decent. You know, and I, I mean, it was hard. I was shocked. I was shocked at how some of the things looked and, and the outsides, like, ah. And, and being a young uh, knucklehead, I started saying stuff. It didn't go over very well. It took a while. It took about, you know, three years before we started doing something different. But people, they just got used to it. They got used to how it looked. They got used to the things and it didn't bother them anymore. Now that's not a spiritual thing, it's just, but it, it does deal with spiritualness. And sometimes we can get used to things where it doesn't bother us anymore. And so we see no urgency. Talk about Jesus. So Paul hated idolatry. Instead of being angry, he opened his mouth in a positive way. Okay, so let's think about this a little bit. Time's going quickly. I, I talk too slow or something. I don't know. I'll try, I'll, try to talk, I, I'll try to talk faster. If I do that, I spit. Okay, so Epicureans and Stoic philosophers were also conversing with him. I don't, I'm not an authority on these things, but I took a couple notes about Epicureans. Epicureans embraced the teachings of a philosopher named Epicurus. It doesn't mean anything. You won't be tested on it. Pleasure was the highest end of living. Eat, drink, and be merry kind of a life. Epicurus meant for good living, like to be generous and kindly and patriotic. I mean, those are good things. But it came to be more about just doing what I like. Followers formed their own standards. They indulged in fleshly pleasures. They denied that matter was created by any kind of deity. They denied the immortality of the soul. They denied the providential control of gods. You can see where we're going here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like a lot of our college professors today. Correct. Then there was on the other end of the spectrum, you had the Stoic philosophers. They believed the world was created by Zeus, which was a deity to them. And they th figured all things were governed by fate or fates. Self-denial uh, contributed to the highest end of life. Their passions and emotions were to be suppressed and restrained. They tried to master over their desires and their lusts. 
they were more into uh, being apathetic to pain and apathetic to pleasure. They also denied the immortality of the soul. So those are kind of important understanding where those people are coming from. And so they're, they're saying, ah, he's just an idle babbler. Or My understanding is it means seed picker. He's just picking little seeds here and there. He's just picking up little things with tidbits of what he might know. And he's going to try to share that with us. So they were uh, downgrading what he had to say. Others said, oh, he's a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And, and of course... Of course. As I studied this, resurrection was also a name of a goddess. Anastasis or something like that. And so they might have thought he meant Jesus and Anastasis. Like strange, now who are these deities? How, how are you putting these together? So I don't know what it is, but they didn't know what they're talking about. They didn't know what Paul was talking about. One thing about it, these two groups were, in, were very different in their beliefs, but they were both skeptics and had contempt for Paul. And so they, drag, they say, let's go down to the Areopagus, and let's, let's hear more about this. This was a place where people made some kind of, you know, rulings or judgments. This wasn't a formal trial or anything like that. Okay, let's look at the sermon. This time is going. Where am I at on this thing? Okay. So he's waiting for Silas and Timothy, blah, blah, blah. Oh yeah, I read that there was maybe 2,000 or 3,000 notable idols in the city of Athens. Oh, I also wanted to look at Romans 1. Turn your Bible to Romans 1. Of course, Paul wrote this. I think it fits in with what we're talking about. Romans chapter 1, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible, incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds, and four-footed animals, and crawling creatures, and all that kind of stuff was all around Athens." So Paul says, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. That's a pretty good start, isn't it? What's he doing there? I mean, he's provoked. Right. <laughs> yeah, he was smart. He, he's appealing to them. He says, I, I've, I've been through here. I see you guys are religious. You're very religious. I mean, he's like, he's just softening them up. He's just like getting them atten their attention. He's, he's, he's finding something in common. That's what I've talked about before. And other people say that one of the things about teaching people or talking to people about Jesus, you've got to find something in common with them. You can't just out of the blue, you know, at the bowling alley say, do you know Jesus? You know, maybe you should say, hey, I, I like to bowl too. You know, and now, do you know Jesus? <laughs> I, I don't know how, how you do all these things. But you've got to find something in common with people and, and, and strike up an interest or they'll just turn you off like that. Paul is looking for an audience. He wants them to listen. So I, I see, I observe, you're very religious in all respects. And for a while I was passing through and examining... The objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Therefore what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. Okay, so I, I keep forgetting about these things up here. So seeing all the saturation of idolatry and all that kind of stuff, he's reasoning in the script, with the scriptures with people. Paul is channeling his fury and his anger to speak for Jesus. And we've already talked about those people. 
Paul is called an idle babbler, blah, blah, blah. So he stands up and he's going to preach the unknown God and teach them who this God is. They don't, they don't know who it is. They just, they're just trying to cover all the bases, right? So if something's wrong out there, we, we're, we may be missing a God. So let's just put something up there to that God so we don't offend Him. And we'll worship Him and we'll kill something and throw the blood on that just to appease that unknown God because that God might have some kind of interest in my life. So Paul is starting to reason from where they are at spiritually. So to the Jews he would preach from the Old Testament, but to these people he didn't because they are not Old Testament people. So if they're not Old Testament people, you don't start preaching the law. You have to go back farther, which he goes back to talk about in the beginning, there is God. So he starts with the first cause of life in his sermon to these people. So there's three main points you can see in this text of getting to know the unknown God. Number one, you've got to recognize that God exists, that he is. Number two, you've got to recognize who this God is. And number three, he's going to talk about what does this God say. And that's what he's going to cover in this short sermon. So recognize who God is. I found an altar to an unknown God. So therefore, I'm going to, worship, I'm going to tell you about this God that you worship in ignorance. And I'm telling you, he is real. There is a real God that you're missing out on. So recognize that God is. The next one is, recognize who God, who God is. So you're going to see these things in this text. He is the creator, right? The, verse 24, the God who made the world and all things in it. You see how that's clashing with uh, some of these philosophies already? Clashing with it. They don't believe in a creator, some of them. But the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. So I can tell I'm going to have to finish this on Sunday. Zach? <laughs> Where does the time go? We haven't even been dilly-dallying too much. Maybe I have. But you guys are, haven't been taking naps. That's good. So anyway, so they got to recognize that God exists and now they need to recognize that who God is. So we could talk a lot about this part of the scripture where he says, the God who made the world and all things in it. You see, God did make the world. And Paul believed that. A plan requires a planner. I'm not a programmer you know, with computers, but a program requires a, what? Programmer. The order and complexity of the universe cannot arise from random chance. And that's what is being taught in schools for years and years, and is called what? Evolution. They call it a theory, and it's really not even a theory, because it cannot be tested, and it cannot be practiced. It is a joke. The reality is, why are there atheists? With all the evidence of a designer, why do people choose to say there is no God? So they don't have to give anything up in their mind. If they can convince themselves there is no God, I'm not accountable to him. That's right. They didn't want to keep that knowledge. It's, it's, it's too demanding. It's too tight. It's too enclosing. Why are there atheists? We're just going to close on this. We'll get to the sermon on Sunday, Lord willing. A little more.
That's right. No matter, even if you believe something, or you choose not to believe a truth, that doesn't make the truth not the truth. And just because, I mean, okay, here's, does anybody know what the, uh, what is that, the second law of thermodynamics? It's a well-known scientific principle. I'm not a scientist, I'm a carpenter. But it states the natural tendency is for things to go from the more ordered to the less ordered state. And evolution says from the less ordered to the more ordered. It totally goes against a proven scientific law. So anyway, um, it's really a lot of faith to believe there is no God. And it's a, it's, I have other words I would attach to that, but I probably shouldn't. They're ignorant. They are lying to themselves. They are lying to everybody else. And we know one thing, you know, <clears throat> we'll just get a sneak peek to the end of this sermon because it's about over, but... And we'll cover this sermon later, but what's he say at the end of it? Having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere, that means these people, you need to repent. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in, in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. So Paul finishes off his sermon, and we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that later, Lord willing. But anyway, he's like, I don't care who you are. You can say there's no God, whatever, but God's going to judge you, and that judgment's going to stand. So he's trying to get people ready. So we'll talk more about that Sunday morning. Thanks for your attention.